moms would die from septic shock like three days later. And they figured out why. The surgeons would teach cadaveral out barehanded, right? And then they wouldn't wash their hands because they know germs existed yet. And they go deliver a baby. And obviously all those, uh, all that bacterial growth in the, the cadavers go into the birthing mom. And that's how they discovered, oh, there must be something that carries disease. Let's call it germs, <laughs> you know? So that's why how germ theory was invented. So it's only like 100, 200 years ago. It wasn't that long ago. So ether, um, dripping ether, there's still some doctors that, like in their 80s and 90s that when they were med students, they used to drop the ether. Wow. So it's, it, it, now we've progressed, guys, since then and now is a lot. All right? So neurosurgery, yeah, who are these people, right? Um, so what do we do? We train forever, unfortunately. Um, so the, the procedures we do go from hardest to easiest. So we do aneurysms, that's where we coil them through a catheter, like a cardiac catheter, so you go one exit up. So you're where we in Port Charlotte. Port Charlotte's the heart, Punta Gorda's the brain. Just go one mile extra, okay? Brain tumors, everyone knows about that. <laughs> Epilepsy, uh, trauma, uh, 75 is tons of accidents. You know, I drove by a couple. Um, so we do a lot of that stuff. For vagal nerve stimulators, that's where we put a electrical coil on the vagal nerve. Seizures like that, and now we're getting epilepsy, Crohn's, RA, carotid endorectomies. Um, neurosurgeons and vascular surgeons discovered around the same time. We believe we've discovered it first, and they believe they discovered it first. It was within three months of each other. Um, so essentially, you open the car carotid RA up, clean it up, and close it up, okay? Um, deep brain stimulation, I'm sure you guys see all the news stories on that. Radio surgery, that's essentially radiation. Uh, neurosurgeon invented that too. And Dr. Lexell, you guys know Lexell Rondra is? Right. right, so that guy invented a lot of stuff. So he would take a brain tumor out, it's a true story, then put the patient in his uh, station wagon, drive them down the street to a warehouse where he's building a uh, radiation uh, accelerator, and he'd give them radiation. And that's how he invented radiation oncology. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was only like 60, 70 years ago. Yeah, so that's how radiation oncology was invented. And neurosurgeons bring people in a car. He's like, just don't worry about it, get in the car. And they, uh, <laughs> they, like, they, they fire up this machine, like essentially like a, like a lawnmower, you know? And then they radiate them. And then, you know, obviously they figured out how much too much radiation was, and also radiation gives you cancer, you know, we're lead. Can't be in the same room. They, they learn, they learn things like that. Carpal tunnels. Um, essentially, neurosurgeons go where the nerves go. Wherever the brain goes, we go. Where the nerves go, we go. All right? And then, the most common thing you guys will see in the community is drug techs. Um, almost every hospital does some sort of spine surgery, okay? So um, the lectures can go over all types of brain surgery you might see. We'll have an emphasis on the equipment, and then we'll kind of do what I do internationally. So whenever we do a mission trip, my scrub techs and I, in the plane or the night before, where, where before the surgeries, we literally like visually go through the surgery, okay? From me walking in, everything we'll absolutely need and use and we kind of visually go through that, and now we make a list of things we'll need. Mm -hmm. We always forget two or three things, okay? And it just happens, but it minimizes things you forget. Here in America, when you forget something, someone goes out into SPD and grabs it, right? In Kenya, West Indies, India, someone has to get, in their, get like, my drivers to come, pick up that person, drive them to the hotel where SPD is set up, FaceTime one of us, and tell them which drawer it's on, and then come back. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. That's, in, that's Kenya. In West Indies, um, it's usually a non-medical person going to get the stuff, by the way. Oh, wow. So last time was my dad. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, and he could barely text. So um, oh, my God. We, uh, we needed, I forgot what we needed. Um, There's something we forgot to get, and it was, it was kind of forgotten, the whole mix of things. So we sent my dad, he had to go to the boat dock, take a boat to where we were staying, we were staying mm -hmm. off the island, that's where the hotel is. So you had to wait for the boat driver to come over, get on the boat driver and connect to Wi-Fi on the island because there's no cell service. Oh, Lord. And then my dad likes to do this thing when he goes, oh, what's this? What's this? What's this for? What's this for? And I was like, dad, just stop the questions and go get the thing. You know? <laughs> so whenever he wants to help us pack, is the whole, we've spent so much time explaining what this is. That's so and then he had get this item, get back on the boat, come back to the dock, get in the car, and come back to the OR, all while we're operating. That's right. crazy. So how that's, how you learn, that's how you learn your lessons. <laughs> they go, yeah, go ahead. How much time was like kind of spent doing that in a sense? Uh, probably like 40 minutes. 40 yeah, yeah. Oh, like the, the um, every country running in the auspices of the government. 
So he like, you know, he gets a police escort or whatever. Yeah. They just cut through traffic, blow red lights. Um, so, all right, so that's essentially what we do. Not too many things, all right? <laughs> so we'll get into some cases and we're, we're gonna go through this together. Now, as a scrub tech, it's important to know you're an equal member of the team, okay? In my OR and most ORs, no one's better than anyone and no one's lower than anyone, okay? Because at the end of the day, we're a team, we're helping one person on the table, all right? So if you're shy, don't say something, that can result in a patient's death or morbidity uh, or something crazy happens, right? Not just because you can speak up. And no one will ever chastise you for speaking up. I know it's kind of intimidating your first weekend. Um, they always throw the students in my room for some reason. Um, <laughs> but, you know, just be, don't be shy and say, hey, Dr. Patel, uh, what's going on over there? What's that? And it's something, you know, I say, oh, it's just this and this and this. Or I'll say, oh yeah, well, you know, what is going on this? Check it out, you know? Um, so before we do any case, you know, let's pretend you guys are on the field now, right? Um, a trauma comes in. And the first thing you guys should do is find out what happened, okay? Um, you guys are equal part of the team. You should have equal knowledge of what's going on. So, you know, it's like, oh, it's a 22-year-old female that we got today. Yeah, 22-year-old female hit by a tractor trailer. All right, so now you know the story. It's a, it's a trauma, all right? So we're gonna need lots of hemostatic, right? Or she's probably gonna be bleeding. Um, it's a good idea, and all my scrub techs do this routinely, they look at the scans too, okay? So if I come in, they've already looked at the scan. And you guys have really good looking scans eventually. And you'll kind of anticipate what I may or may not need. All right, so this is some quick anatomy. Here's a skull. And these are all the approaches we take to get to tumors and aneurysms, okay? Mm. And anyone know what that thing is right there, that metal thing? Mayfield. It's that Mayfield head holder. All right, so as a scrub tech, you have to start thinking about what things do I need for the table. You're not just a person that handles the surgery itself, you're also involved in setting up the room, all right? So it's a team process, and so we gotta kind of dis discuss things like you may or may not need. And don't be afraid to walk into the surgeon and say, hey, I picked the following things, do you need anything additional? Or to kind of take something off the field that you don't want, all right? So just, it's an active conversation. Before every surgery I ever do in my life, I have a little powwow with my scrub tech nurse. We discuss things I may need, may not need, a little alligator that I might be looking out for, all right? So don't be afraid to talk to the surgeon before the surgery, what you may or may not need, and they'll actually really appreciate it. It makes things go smoother, and they're not getting annoyed because nothing's there. And you'll hear us say all the time, like, does everyone look at my card? You know, but the card is a myth, a myth, as I think you guys all know. It's a Christmas wish list. You get some things on all things. <laughs> you'll hear comments like this all the time, all right? All right, so there's some other anatomy. So here's the skull right here, and you have this big muscle called temporalis muscle, it's right here. All right, if you clench your jaw, you can feel it. Some people have bigger ones than others, that just means they talk more. All right? <laughs> yeah. So if you want three thick ones, like, oh, this person must talk a lot. You know? So mine's huge. Um, <laughs> uh, so that muscle is in the way of the temporal bone, okay? So that's something we can cut away to get there. And so you have the skin, all right? We won't go over the way to the scalp. And then you have the skull, all right, and it's covered by the temporalis muscle below in front of your ear. And then you have what's under the skull, anyone know? There's shout out answers, there'll be spirit questions here. Yeah. Dura, nice, who said that? Yeah. All right, good job, you too. Yeah. All right, all right, so this does not look normal, right? Unless it does, and we just move on. <laughs> all right, so this is a CAT scan. So a good thing about looking at CAT scan symmetry. So we have a laser on this guy? Yeah, this in the middle, the big button in the middle, doctor. This big button? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, this side, this is the skull, this big bright white thing, right? There's something different on both sides, right? Mm -hmm. That's all caved in. So look, always look for symmetry. Something that's looking at the other side, it's probably something wrong. This is all blood right here, okay? So this little girl got, got in a car accident, and her skull got caved in, okay? Mm -hmm. This is a contusion. And whenever you have a skull fracture, you're a high risk of getting epidural hematoma. Right, because there's a lot of vasculature of the bone. Yeah. So we have to take these people over pretty quickly. All right. So here's another. Let's see a step in. Question there. Let's see it there. All right. See that? So look at the symmetry, right? Nice and intact. All messed up. All right. All right. So now we are preparing for this case now. Okay. So I call the OR and say, well, level one trauma. Uh, we're going to do a left hemicranium. All right, and decompression of the brain. So heavy cranium is only half the skull, all right? Mm -hmm. So now, now let's go through the exercise. Let's pretend we're in Kenya, 
okay? When we're doing trauma there. Happens all the time, right? So now I'm talking to you guys. Now let's go through the case. All right, so I walk in the door. Okay, what's the first thing I need to do? Gown and glove. All right, do we have gowns and gloves for everybody? This is a real conversation we have. How many gloves are we gonna need? You know, um, am I gonna change my gloves? How often am I gonna change them? Every 30 minutes, every hour? My drape then change? These are questions to ask. You want all the gloves ready to go. A trauma like this, you don't wanna waste running around because minutes mean life, right? This is a very quick case. Not much joking around, not telling many jokes during this case or stories, which I normally do, all right? Um, so gown and gloves. So do you have your gown and gloves? Do you have extra gloves for yourself? Um, how often am I gonna change my gloves? Ask me, all right? Make sure it's in the room. All right, what else do we need? So I walk in the room, all right? Before the patient comes in, what else we're gonna do? All right, good time out. So now let's just talk about the surgery now. All right, so what do you need? I want to let the patient stay naked on the table? No, <laughs> drapes. drapes. All right, drapes. All right, so what kind of drapes do we need? Yeah, yeah. yeah. turning on your drape, right? Now, there's a couple of types of drapes. There's clear ones, there's blue ones, you know? So ask me, which, do you want the clear one? Do you want the uh, one with the big pouch? What do you think we probably want? Yeah. A big pouch, right? A lot of blood, all right? Um, so we got the drapes down, right? So what else do we want now? What else do we discuss? Pouch. What was that? Pouch. Towels, all right, good, blue towels. We'll need those to drape off the patient. What else? All right, so skin marker. Ray tax. So let's walk through it. Now let's walk through the surgery. I walk in, I scrub in, I put my glam gloves on. You guys are already scrubbed in. Patients come out, I shave the head, okay? I drape the patient, all right? Now, now, now let's go through the entire surgery. I drape the patient, now what do I need my hand first? Very mark the patient. Scalpel. Right, I gotta get into the skin, right? Alright, so when I cut the skin, what's gonna happen? So Bobby. What else do I need? How many? Two. Two minimum. And then you have a suction on the bag. Alright, so you have three suctions actually. One on the bag, two on uh, two on the field. Why? Because I clog them all the time. No, where am I in the world? India, America, Kenya, I have clogged them. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I also don't get it. All right, so the skin's bleeding a lot. What can I do besides uh, Bovi and bipolar? Rainy clips. We said rainy clips. Sorry. Yeah. Rainy clips, right? So rainy clips uh, clamp the scalp. You can actually bleed to death from your scalp. So you know these people that come in from car accidents and they have scalp lack and they're, they're giving them blood? is because the scalp is super vascular. It will bleed like crazy. So a lot of people need blood transfusion just from a scalp lack. So you know, you you know, whenever you Google your name in Florida, you see something cool in your date of birth. So like, you know, there's a lot of machete attacks around here for some reason. So the reason they uh, don't do well is because they're bleeding from their scalp like crazy. So rainy clips clamp the skin and the, the aponeurosa and stops the bleeding. So before we had rainy clips, we used to do interrupted sutures parallel along the scalp before we cut it. <clears throat> so we do that sometimes we have going out of rainy clips or something. That's like 1940 stuff. But in third world countries, you gotta do 1940 stuff, right? Cause there's too much 1940 there. Um, so yeah. the interrupted sutures and the parallel to the incision is essentially a rainy clip, okay? So rainy clips, good. Then you ask me, how do you want your rainy clips? Do you want them on a gun or on clamps? <laughs> right, I'm, a, I'm a clamp guy. You know, I don't like the gun too much. I did, I did snap them on myself, all right? So these are questions you ask the surgeon before you walk in. How do you want your rainy clips? Everyone's different, all right? There's no right or wrong way. My way is most, mostly usually the right way. <laughs> <laughs> so, rainy clips, right? So now I got the scalp open. I'm staring at skull. My rainy clips, I got hemostasis. And um, now what? I need to get to the, I need to get to the, into the, into the skull, right? How are you in the skull? A saw. Drill. Is this when you're ortho rotation? <laughs> A drill. Right, so there's two types of drills. There's a, um, there's a I, use, I use the acorn bill, or acorn burr personally. There's also a perforator. So a perforator is like this metal thing that spins and stops and hits soft tissue. Okay, so the holes are huge they make, and I'm more cosmetic. So I like use acorn drill bits. Um, they're smaller, about eight millimeters, and make smaller holes, and they're easier to manage when it comes to um, plating later. All right, so that's something you gotta ask the surgeon. Do you want a perforator, or do you want a acorn drill bit? Okay. Acorn drill is better. <laughs> so now, I made my holes, okay? Now what am I gonna do? I need to free up my dura from the skull. How do I do that? What instrument can I use? Okay, 
Panda Sector. There's still some names out there. Woodson? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Woodson, a pen field, right? How many pen fields do we use? Anyone know? One, two, three, four pen fields? Four pen fields? Four. Yeah. Dr. Penfield, what kind of doctor was he? Someone that elevated someone. He was a neurosurgeon. No. <laughs> the answer to most of my questions is neurosurgery. <laughs> yeah. The nurse is always telling my like, students when I walk in, he's gonna ask you a lot of questions, the answer is the same every time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I take a, a Woodson elevator or, or three pen field and I elevate the dura, all right? So now I, I separate the dura from the skull, all right? So now I'm gonna get the skull off. And I make 45 burr holes? No. The, no. All right, so I, uh, what's the, uh, the cutter we use, what's it called? V1 bit and foot plate. Cool. All right, so now I use a V1 bit foot plate, all right? So this thing is a side cutting saw and it connects the burr holes, all right? So during that part, the scrub tech has squirt water on it so it doesn't overheat, all right? And sometimes if the, um, the drill is really like old and get really hot, to kind of squirt the water on my hands and burn my hand, mm -hmm. all right? So now we've connected our burr holes, all right? Now my skull flap separated from the skull itself. How can I elevate it? Three pet field works, right? Or a joker, all right? We'll go over these instruments later. <laughs> All right, so, so these are the things you guys anticipate, the instruments we're going to use because when we, when we get in sync eventually, I'm not talking at all. I'm just putting my hand out and what I need goes in my hand. And I always say, give me what I need, not what I want. Mm -hmm. You know, so I may ask for something dumb, you give something else, oh yeah, I actually, want, I meant that. All right, so when scrub picks are really good, they anticipate the certain needs and give them what they need, not what they ask for. Okay, and um, who's the best neurosurgeon in Philadelphia? It's actually a scrub tech. So his name is a lady named Janice Bynum, mm -hmm. and she's a uh, registered first assist RFA, and I highly recommend you guys go for RFA if you can. And she has trained more neurosurgeons than anyone else in the United States. Mm -hmm. And whenever you ask a neurosurgeon in Philadelphia, and she trained me too, who would you want doing your cranial plastic craniectomy? We all say Janice Bynum, and she's a scrub tech. Mm -hmm. All right, from a technical standpoint, she is phenomenal. So a great example is I was doing an aneurysm clipping, and I asked her like a five millimeter right angle, and she handed me a seven millimeter curve. And I, I was like, oh, hmm. But then I was like, yeah, that's actually, that's actually what I needed. Not what I asked for. Because she's done so many surgeries. And um, there's this famous neurosurgeon called Frank Simeone, who was her boss for many, many years. He bought her like a Mercedes, uh, bought a couple cars. That's how she valued her. You know, because she trained all the residents. The only time like a junior resident would beat up by themselves in the OR is when Janice Bynum was scrubbed in. So that's how good she was. If she was in the room, then there's a chance, oh, you'd be fine. Because she Janice is there, all right? So um, there's way, you know, don't ever let the sky limit you, okay? So the best neurosurgeon is not a doctor. You know, until this day, if I need something done, I'm calling Janice. Like, Janice, where are you working? I need, you know, my head opened up, all right? <laughs> so now here's the brain. There was no one, right? Yeah. All right, so here's the skin. What are these things? Brain clips. Brain clips, all right? All right, so this is a skull right here. It looks better on the computer screen, probably. And what's this flap right here? Nice. What's this right here? It's not a kidney. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so it's a brain. This is an angry brain. It should not be that red. Okay, we call this hyperemia. Okay? So this is the, that girl. What do you, what's this little, this little red cloth right here? That black stuff. Subdural hemorrhage. Okay? So now, the brain is open. Okay, so now we have to do a couple things. We need to turn our suction down. Okay, so I don't suck up brain accidentally, right? The biggest enemy of neurosurgery is suction. You know, because you know, in the beginning we want to max suction, right? You never suck as hard, you know, quick enough. But now we're in a delicate part of the brain. And also now we can calm down. The emergency is over. I have released the pressure in the brain. Think of the brain like a pressure cooker and there's too much pressure. Our goal is to get the pressure off as fast as possible. Once it's off, I tell everybody, all right, we calm down, turn the music on, now let's just finish up, okay? So that's when everyone gets kind of calm once the pressure's off and the bleeding stops, all right? So now, the brain's open, the flaps are open, I'm leaving the skull off. So this is another scrub tech job. Now what are you doing with the skull? Where's it gonna go? Garbage? <laughs> all right, so we have a special freezer for the bone. So you guys have to scrape the bone and you put it in this little special baggie and it goes in a sterile freezer. Okay, 
And then every once a month we check the freezer. Um, this crop actually does, it's a pod leader. And she checks who's still alive, all right? It's kind of morbid, but she has to do that because you throw away the skull if you don't need anymore. There's a pop proper disposal for that. Everything's super regulated, especially human tissue. You can't store in the garbage, all right? So you, put the, you gotta prepare the skull flap because we're gonna put it back on in a few weeks, eight to 12 weeks. Or in Kenya, India, Africa, we can't, there's no million dollar freezer. The freezer costs about you know, a quarter million. Um, we put it in their belly. That way it's, it's with them at all times. So wherever they go, their skull's with them. So I, so I make an incision here, I make a little pocket and shove it in there. Um, so whenever I see a patient with half a skull missing, the first thing I do is palpate their belly. Like, like, do you have your skull with you? And um, that's good. whenever you have a patient that's like homeless or nomadic, uh, even though we have that freezer, we're more likely to in the belly because we may never see the patient ever again. Mm -hmm. You know, he may get released, we don't know where he ends up, and whoever neurosurgeon stumbles upon him, they at least have the skull to put it back on. Yeah? So what do you put in replace of the skull? Good question. So now that we have the skull missing, you know, like his wife or husband or whatever can punch him right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, you put some, uh, this recorded? <laughs> so you uh, we put dural substitute down, all right? It's uh, there's duragen, duramatrix. We use bovine pericardium. Uh, there's Gore-Tex. There's all kinds of stuff. And the reason we put something down between the skull, I'm sorry, between the brain and the dura, is because everything. There's always a lesson behind everything. Like about 20, 30 years ago, we put nothing down. It's called the scalp over the brain. The brain is greedy. It grabs blood vessels. So it would pull blood vessels down from the scalp into itself. Wow. So when they went back in to put the bone on, they were tearing brain off because the brain had infiltrated the scalp. Wow. So then we learned that you had to put something between the brain and the scalp. And there's actually a surgery we do where we, we utilize that called EDAS, but we don't need to talk about that today. All right? um, so we put a, something between the brain and the scalp, and then we um, close up the, the incision over it, and then the patients will wear a helmet whenever they're walking around. All right. And then um, I always tell the scrub to make no bone there, and she always writes it upside down and make fun of her. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's what we put there. Great question. Now, well, how do I close this? What do I use? Suture, right? Suture first, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there's the next question. Dr. Patel, what kind of suture do you use? All right? It's good to anticipate these things, right? Especially because sometimes we need to close it very quickly. It's something called malignant intracranial hypertension where the brain starts to swell like a mushroom and goes out of the skull. If that starts happening, if you have to the pediatrics and two, three year olds, for some reason the brain just loses all control and all mayhem breaks loose and the brain starts ballooning out, we have to close very quickly. That's the fastest close you'll see in your life. The surgery, the hands will be very quickly and you gotta load the sutures just as fast, all right? So you load the sutures fast, have two ready to go and keep throwing at them and that's when you call for help. Whenever you have that happening, another scrub tech scrubbing in. All right, it's not, that's not a one person show anymore. That's a two person show because there's one person handing me the suture, the other person's loading it. There can be no gap in care, all right? And this is something you ask. And we'll say that, hey, I, might, I suspect we might have to close this very quickly, make sure there's another scrub tech available to scrub it immediately and have lots of suture on the table so that we can't have someone running out in the hallways getting it, you know? And I always say someone weaving it for me, you know, it's taking so long. <laughs> there you see these comments, so, all right? Oh, yes. All right, so this is afterwards. You know, so this is a skull missing. All right, it's look, so let's look at, see how it's ballooning out? Yeah. So that's why you got to close it quickly. And yeah. right, this is her right here. Yeah. Yeah. She did well. All right, so now, moving on to the next one. We're trying to cover all these procedures, all right, guys? And just stop me with questions. So this cat, this cat scan was normal too, right? Yeah. yeah. What's wrong with this cat scan? Where is the tumor on this thing, one though? Right here? No. Uh, uh, no. Yeah. Lucky guess. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so this tumor is massive. Yeah. Right? So this is called meningioma. Alright, so now we went from trauma to brain tumors. And just to kind of recap the trauma real quick, you need you need to ask me what hemostatic agents I want. Can they, can anyone name all the hemostatic agents? Jump on? Avatine? Anything else? Surgis cell. Yeah. All right. What else? What comes in little syringe you squirt in there? Flow seal. Surgical. Surgical. Yeah. What else? 
Yeah. Oh. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Noise, so good. <laughs> yeah. All right, so ask us what we're gonna need, okay? Something to need the kitchen sink. All right, if there's a huge trauma, lots of bleeding, we'll throw everything at it, we can throw at it. All right, cold water works really well too. It helps cause play the aggregation, okay? Um, all right, so this is a tumor. A little different pace now, right? We're not screaming and yelling and running in there. You know, the world's not ending. All right, so this patient has a big tumor, so now the question you ask is, but I'm going to tell how are we positioning this patient. The reason you need to know is you need to know where you're going to stand. All right, this patient on the other side, park bench, you know, lateral. What are we doing here? All right, so I'll tell you how they be positioned, and I'll tell you where I want you to stand, where I'm going to stand. All right, and then we'll have other things in the room. All right, like uh, image guidance. So sometimes you use image guidance for tumors. It's a GPS system for the brain. Things bulky and huge and scrub text hate it because it gets in their way. So we say, all right, we'll put the image guidance here, you'll stand here, your table will be there, I'll be here, okay? That's something we talked about before the patient comes in. That way it's set up so we're not like looking like amateurs in there. The key to neurosurgery is even if you don't know what you're doing, act like you do, all right? <laughs> so we, we discuss the positioning, and now we ask what we might need. So the same thing as before. Um, so we need to open the skull, right? So perforator, brain eclipse, um, if you want a bit of foot play, that's a side cutting saw. And then now, we need to open the dura in a controlled fashion. The last patient, the dura was torn open for me, and we have to open it, right? But now this dura is intact. So how can I open dura? Yeah, so I use 4 o neural on, a little suture, I use it to tack it up. Because I don't want the suture cutting to brain, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if it's a major blood vessel, I can make the patient not be able to talk anymore. You know, might as well write the check to the lawyers then. <laughs> so the key is to avoid complications. So I take a four neural line, I tent up the dura, and I take a 15 blade and I cut it. And then I put a patty underneath and I slide the patty so the patty's on the brain, I'm above it. Okay, and then we cut along the lines. All right? So things we gotta ask, right? Not that big. <laughs> All right, so here is, here's Ann. That's my scrub tech. All right, this is a, a Cuban neurosurgeon we train the Cubans to now. This is I'm in a mission trip here. When I look down, it looks like America. All right, so I always tell people. So Anne is a uh, RFA, all right, so she can close, open, whatever. I let her do a lot of things, you know, beyond her job description. Um, so here's our craniotomy. So there's a burr hole there, there, there. I, mean, I don't do that many burr holes because I don't think it looks cosmetically well. And I connected them right there, see that line, that cut line? All right, and then here's the bone after it's taken off. Um, All right. Now here's the dura's open now, and it's me taking the tumor out. Let's uh, say I think this might be a video actually. Let's see. Mm -hmm. tumors out, this is kind of important for you guys to know now, we use a million patties. So we use the patties to dissect the brain from the tumor. We're not really brain surgeons, we're tumor surgeons. We try not to touch the brain at all. all right? We try to stay focused on the tumor. So what we do is we make boundaries on both sides. See, these are all these patties, they're all patties. There's probably like 50 or 60 in there right now. And every corner I start shoving them in there and I core out the tumor from the outside in. And all those patties separate the brain from the tumor. Once I get all 360 degrees around it, then I pull it out. So you're, you're asking me what kind of patties will I need? Okay, there's a million varieties of them. And every surgeon has their own preference. All right, so get the patties ready. The other thing is, do you hand the patties to me wet or dry? Wet, why? Stick to what? Right. Because you don't want to tear off the first layer of the brain. There's, the brain has seven layers. They're called cortical layers, one through seven. The first two are very important. Okay, and unfortunately, they're the ones on the surface. 
So you can't go tearing things off like sandpaper. Okay, a patient wake up with basic, can't eat or walk or paralyzed, something crazy. You know, so these subtle things that you guys do is important for the patient's outcome. Especially in a, in a high energy atmosphere where we're working quickly, if you're, the pie's not wet, I don't have time to check it. So sometimes I'll, I'll rub it on my glove to make sure I see some water. Uh, but if it's in a high tense situation, you gotta be on top of your game. So I'm just gonna throw them in there. I don't have time to check it. So that's why it's important to stay cognizant and remember the small little rules of life. Patties always have to be wet, you know? Hand the suture angles, like use them immediately or they'll reposition it. If you see a surgeon reposition your needle two, three times, ask them, how would you like your needle loaded? Okay, don't just keep doing the same way. All right, and some people won't say anything like me, it'll just keep going, all right? All right, let me put this back up. Oh, there you go. So that's a tumor, all right? So, you know, I don't know if you guys ever know this. You know, you get a haircut, you cut a lot of hair off, your hair feels so light. Am I the only one that feels that? <laughs> right, so, anyway, so I asked him, does your head feel lighter? She's like, yeah, actually, it feels a lot lighter. <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's a big hole left behind. All right. Those are, all right. Now, moving on to pediatrics. All right. Anyway, any questions back here? Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. What kind of symptoms would the patient be experiencing? So she was blind from this one pushing off the nerves and she had um, hemiplegia, so uh, one side of her body was paralyzed. Yeah. Is that the other that was, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Is that uh, the blindness is permanent, but the paralysis got better. So she's been blind for about seven years. So you remember in these countries, the only time a neurosurgeon is there is like fly there, right? So they have to wait like usually a year or six months, depending on where we are. In Kenya, we go every four months, the team going. In uh, West Indies, every six months, and but usually they don't get to us, and they've already had symptoms for seven, eight years because they can't afford to have surgery. So in these countries, it's cash for care. So if your family doesn't have like fifty grand laying around, which none of them do, they have, they just have to do nothing and wait for a nonprofit like ours to show up one day. Yeah, you stretching? Yeah. Don't go off. Oh, right. <laughs> Actually, does the brain um, like go back into a normal place, or is there always? Some yeah, so space? it depends on the, how big the tumor is. So most tumors, the brain will eventually fill back up in that hole. Mm -hmm. But this one, you'll have a huge hole there forever. It'll mm -hmm. still with CSF, the spinal fluid in there. Mm -hmm. And when you get a scan, it'll be a big little hole. It'll be a little contracted from before, and it will close up a, a good amount, by 40, 50%. So it'll still be a little cavity there. So I had a question, Dr. Man, yeah. I've had this discussed before, even on the field. Uh, obviously the flap's going back on on this. Right. Will you, open time? Will, will you put the flap in, this is a debate, antibiotic solution or non-antibiotic? So, um, well, now we take the flap off, we put in a, uh, in a towel, and it's wet. So just for you, a towel? Yeah, a towel, wet towel. What about antibiotics for the brain? So the CDC just released data like five years ago <laughs> that um, antibiotic solution does nothing. So at Harvard, <coughs> we stopped using it all the other. So no more bacitracin and irrigation. Um, so because it literally does nothing. They, they looked at both, you know, the cohorts, uh, bacitracin and irrigation, non, and it was literally the same. And it, it, just, it ended up costing more for nothing. There's a lot of voodoo in medicine, you guys know this. You know, we do a lot of things that don't make sense because we can't experiment on it. Like I can't say, oh, this person will get surgery, this one won't, and let that person die. So a lot of this retrospective data, we look backwards and see, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, any other questions? Brain tumors, we're good? You guys are experts? <laughs> All, right. All right, so now, this is in Kenya, it's like five months ago. So this baby has something called hydrocephalus, right? Big head, okay? Eyes are popping out, all right? Um, and he also has a, a myelomeningocele. That's where the spinal cord is coming out of the back, okay? So this is, this is a baby, so we first did the shunt first, okay? So now, I'm doing a shunt, we're switching gears here, okay? So, does anyone know what a shunt is? Raise your hand. Some of you guys? All right, so a shunt is, is a tube that goes from the brain to the belly to shunt fluid. There's too much fluid in the brain, you can't drain it or absorb it. That mechanism is flawed, so I have to divert it, all right? So we divert in a few locations. I can put it in the belly, I can put it in the lungs, I can put it in the heart, I also put it in the bladder, okay? Most common location you guys will see is a VP shunt, ventricular peritoneal, and it's in the belly, okay? So they usually have they position the baby, so it's a straight shot down, and the things you I need now are, the pediatrics is different. So a baby only has a small amount of blood. So what we, uh, the normal blood loss from an adult will deplete all the blood for a baby. So hemostasis is supreme. 
So we use a different Bovi, he's a Colorado tip, okay? So we try to lose as, 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 probably two, three cc's minimum, or maximum, on the way in. So we use a Colorado tip, so that's something you gotta ask. Do you want a Colorado tip as pediatrics? They usually be on the car, but no one reads those. And you'll say, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, most of them are. Um, <laughs> so a Colorado tip is a fine tip, Bovi, and it cauterizes a, a scalpel. Okay, we use that to get in. And then we need to get here somehow, right? So you use a shunt passer, a Kelly, a lot of couple things, okay? And then we need to bring the shunt from here to here. So usually I use a, um, some silk, uh, silk suture. So I pass the suture through this trail I make and I pull it through, okay? And this is all things that the scrub tech has to do on the back table, all right? Oh yeah, so going back, I'm sorry. So the bone, has to be played and put back in, right? So uh, depending on how much experience you guys get with you will over time, we'll let you guys do that. So we'll tell you which place we want and we'll let you plate the bone. Okay, and we'll, and we'll just check it and put it in. So as time goes on, you guys want to plate the bone. Just uh, don't go freestyling it. Do ask us what you want. Um, so Anne right there, she, she routinely plates the bone for us, okay? And sometimes she can't get the screw in, so I asked her if she wants me to open some jars for her too later. <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, so we did this baby Sean first. Okay, the reason the baby was in the hospital is because his um, his mild meningocele was leaking spinal fluid and he got meningitis. All right, so whenever you're leaking spinal fluid, you, the hydrocephalus is pushing the water out. So you have to fix the hydrocephalus first. So that's why we did the shunt first, and then hey, look, that's a um, hernia, by the way. Okay, so then we flipped him over. Okay, and that's the mild in the seal. And you know, we always have to check the uh, nurses' bags to try to steal the babies. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, we learned a lot of lessons. Like um, we brought diapers because a lot of them don't have diapers, and we don't want the baby pooping on their incision. So like little small, subtle things you have to think about, right? And then we also learned we need pacifiers. You know, instead of using our finger. So you can tell that if we bring moms with us. They know what to do. You know, us non-parents like, ah, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> um, so then this is the mild major seal. This is spinal cord right here. So we're separating it. All right, and then we close it up. All right? And this is him afterwards. So see how small his head is now? And he's like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> 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 Good game candid moment, baby. <laughs> That's not my mom. <laughs> yeah, he did really well. All right, so there's the next patient. What's wrong here? You need to be a doctor for most of the stuff out. Right? So you see this? So yeah, so the, the tumor's coming out of the skull now, right? It's called osteoidosteoma. Alright? Here's a scat cat scan of it. The magnetic bone, alright? I have 23 days left in my trial. <laughs> <laughs> so, here we go. So, we did a decision over it. Rainy clips, right? Retractors. Okay? Same thing over and over again. Neurosurgery is boiled down to a couple things. And there's only a small small deviation. So, once you know the basic steps, you guys are pretty much fine. You know, it takes a couple reps. And always ask questions. Most people in a controlled setting that's not stressful, like not bleeding, or like something crazy happening, we'll explain things to you guys. So don't be shy to ask questions, like, you know. So my, my students are asking a million questions, you know, and I, I answer all of them as, as I can if we're not doing something crazy. So you don't ask, you know, how come you use that and not this? You know, why do you do it this way, not this way? I see Dr. Blank do it, and I'll say Dr. Blank is wrong. <laughs> um, so I'm just kidding. Um, so we took it out, see that? So obviously I can't put this back in, right? So now that's a good question you guys ask us, right? So you're like, all right, Dr. Patel, you're taking this whole thing out. But you obviously can't put the tumor back in. It's a skull tumor. How are we going to close that defect? A plate. What's that? A plate. Yeah, you use a plate or mesh, or you can actually have 3D print uh, a skull plate. Oh, cool. Yeah, so um, a lot of hospitals have a 3D printer now that prints these acrylic skull flaps to the perfect margins of the bone we shove it on. Okay. And the, the military has a lot for plastic injuries in Afghanistan and stuff like that. They're complex fractures. So we did a met. So uh, there's a the brain again. There's a dura. See that? So this tumor is invading the dura into the brain. It's a little dent there. You can't see that well. Right. So then we did a mesh cranioplasty. Okay. Now it's all flat. That's a Mayfield, right? All right.
right next. What is this one? Oh yeah. Okay. So the next one is we're almost done with the cranial section. So anyone know what a pituitary tumor is? Yeah. So if I put a knife between my right here and go like two inches back, I'll hit my pituitary gland. Okay. So the reason I'm showing this one because it's not a typical brain surgery. So normally for tumors we go through the skull. For pituitary tumors we go through the nose. All right. The shortest distance to a tumor is the best way to get to a tumor. So we go through the nose, okay? So here's the, the pituitary tumor, and look at this. See that? So we have ENT and some neurosurgeons do their own approaches, and they expose it all the way up to right here, okay? And once they get me there, I take down this bone, and I'm right on top of the uh, tutor, tumor, all right? So there's the side view. You. And here's the opening. And this is a skull for you, the endoscope. So now, the reason I brought this up is because it's a different surgery. Now you have two surgeons, your ENT surgeon and a neurosurgeon. Okay? And one's gonna be making fun of the other one a lot. Alright? It's key not to laugh too loud. Um, so first you need to help out the ENT surgeon, get exposure, so you can ask him what he needs or her, what they need, don't need. Um, they have a completely different instrument set. You need thread on the field. You're using a scope. It gets blurry fast. It fogs up. Whenever they take the scope out, you're taking a, um, a ray tech and wiping it for them or her. All right? They don't even notice this. They just, things are going great for them just because you guys are doing a good job. All right? So you um, keep wiping out the scope. Inside of the scope holder, you know, you get that set up. So you need to, need to know what they're going to use. Are you using an endoscope holder? Are you someone going to hold it for you? Are you a resident? These are questions you need to ask because you have to add the attachments to the bed. It's all your job. Get all this stuff ready. So once they expose, the neurosurgeon comes in, um, we make a couple of jokes, it took them too long to get there. And then we, we take it out, okay? And the, then the ENT closes it up. They put a little flap there, and they close it, they put some uh, rock, rockets in there, and there's some strings coming out of the nose, they tie it up, okay? And then it's it. So uh, there's, there's no incision in the skull, they're fine. You cannot give them straws afterwards, they might go up in their skull. You know, you can't do NG tubes, right? Nothing through the nose. Uh, that's a nursing thing on the floor. So you, you, you'll see those famous CAT scans of the NG tube curled up in the brain. It's because they tried, they didn't realize the patient had brain surgery through the nose. They put NG tube and goes in the brain. Very rare now, all right? So what's next? All right. All right, spine. Any more um, brain questions? You guys experts? Can I leave? <laughs> cool. All right, spine. So we got this dude, 59 year old guy, drunk guy. Um, he has a car accident. He had a car accident, so he has this lumbar fracture, five, four, burst fracture, okay? Now, lumbar and cervical are the most common things you guys are gonna do in the community. So this is kind of where you kind of, all you guys are zoning out because I'm so boring. I come in real, come back in real quick, all right? So this is a lumbar spine, and if you're doing a posterior approach, the patient is prone. If you're an anterior approach, patient is like an A-lift, okay? We'll go over that a little later. So this patient is going to be a prone, a posterior approach, they're face down, okay? Open Jackson table, or whatever. These are questions you got to ask. What table are you going to use? So now we go over this procedure, kind of more detail, because you'll see this all the time. All right, so there's a burst fracture. This patient needs a laminectomy and a fusion, unstable fracture, okay? So now, we're going to do this together now. All right, guys, so the patient's coming back. Take 20 minutes. Getting the room ready. So, what do we need? Gowns, and, I'll start you guys off. Gowns, gloves, drapes. There's a couple types of drapes, right? There's U drapes, there's cranny drapes, there's lumbar spine drapes, whatever the preference is. Right, drapes still on suction, we need two suctions, right? Um, instruments now. So, we'll be putting pedicle screws in. So, what do you guys need? The pedicle screws. <laughs> you to make sure they're sterile. Okay, the last thing you want to do is open the patient up and realize the screws aren't ready. Okay, so, you need to know what screws I need. Then you need to know what biologic I'm gonna use. It helps the fuse. So this is something else you need from the field. Um, patties, all right? So now, here's a quick anatomy lesson. Um, so this is an axial view, um, bird's eye view. The first thing you see when you come down the fascia, coming this way, you know, you kind of these bumps in your back. You see those, you guys feel those bumps? Those are called spinous processes, all right? So that's the first thing we encounter when we're dissecting. And we expose this area right here. 
This is called a pedicle right here. That's where the screw goes. It goes down this pipe right into here. All right? So that's a surgery. And then the laminectomy is, whenever you use the word ectomy, that means removed in Latin. We're removing this whole part right here. Okay? So now, I expose everything. I have this exposed, I have that exposed. Now, how do I remove the spinous process? What instrument can I use? Yeah, Alexel. So orthopedic surgeons call it a Ron Gerr. And not Alexel, you know why? Because they refuse to say no to his name. <laughs> so they always say Ron Gerr because they're just embarrassed because we're better than them. Um, so, all right, so I get the spinous process off. What else can I use to fight it off? You can use a rip cutter. No. Or is a rip cutter. I like the side angle biter. I just, I just snap them off. All right, so that's what I like to use because it's quicker. Um, now, so I have this part removed, and I have this part only. This is a lamina. So how can I remove the lamina? Any ideas? There's a couple ways to skin a cat. Yeah, so I can use a drill, right? So that's another question. Dr. Tell you need a drill. The answer is yes on all spine cases. So I can thin it out to eggshell thickness, okay? Um, what's another way? I use a Lexel again. I can chomp it down. Um, I use something called a bone scalpel. It's a oscillating blade. I just cut troughs and I snap it off, which is what I like to do. Um, so let's pretend I do the thinning it down part, right? So I thin it down to two millimeter thickness. How can I remove it now? What um, instrument can I use to bite it? it starts with a K and ends with an S. It has two R's in the middle. <laughs> Garrison, nice. All right. So yeah, so you, then now you ask me, what kind of kerosens will you be using? You know, you're using a one, two, three, those numbers mean millimeters of how wide it is. You know, um, below five, yeah, it was a six actually. Um, so, you know, I usually, use, I usually use three and fours and fives, you know. Um, and then also, you know, you need ties during the laminectomy, the answer is yes. You put them between the dura and the bone. You don't want to get something called durotomy. So let's pretend we get a durotomy. That's why I open the dura and the spinal fluid everywhere. Um, then you need to know how we're going to close it, all right? So there's a suture repair kit. It's Castro Viejo's, you know, micro instruments, and then the suture we use is different. You can't just use nylon or something. We use usually Neuralon or Gore-Tex. Okay, I'm a Neuralon guy. All right, so that's something I anticipate. Say, hey, Dr. Patel, what do you think will be a durotomy when we find one? Whenever you have a, a fracture like this, sometimes a bone friend can cut the dura. You know, so sometimes we'll say, all right, I'm anticipating CSF here. Make sure we have the furrow neural in the room, the dura seal, it's a sealant, and the patch. All right. Those are questions you guys need to ask. And no one's ever gonna be offended for you guys being ready, right? If the doctor's offended, you'll probably be fired within a few months, <laughs> all right? So that's the lumbar anatomy, spinous cross lamina, vertebral body, all right? So this is a, the patient's down, looking down, face down right now, and they're prone. This is the view I have, okay? So I come down here, I cut them off with a um, rip cutter, okay? And this is the lamina I've already done. I have seven patients in the hospital today. Okay. We're okay. I don't know why. So this is a lamina removal right here. I'm moving from there to there, okay? And what's this yellow thing here? You don't know? Look at the eyes. I just read that part. Look at my flavor. Sure. Look at flavor. So that we remove the keratin as well, okay? It's a protective tissue layer above the dura. All right? So once that's all out, the dura is free. You know, then we, we already put our instruments in, and we go for that, all right? So this is what it looks like afterwards, all right? So these screws are going down these pipes, see those pipes? All right? And this is a rod. So now, this is where you, um, so now we put the screws in. So what's this workflow for screws? Ask the surgeon, because you want to be able to hand me things on me talking, right? Or you don't want to interrupt my story, because it's hilarious. <laughs> so, you know, the first thing we do is we take a drill and make my pilot hole. I made a pile hole right here, okay? Then I used something called gear shift. It's this pointy metal thing. And I, I twist it down from there to there, okay? And then I used something called ball probe. I'm palpating to make sure I have bony walls all around. So I want to make sure I can go this way into the spinal canal, all right? So my workflow is drill, gear shift, ball probe. Then I, I used something called tap, which makes a little pathway for the screw. Makes little rivets, okay? Then you ask me what size screw do I want, you just make it up, all right? So I'll say 6, 5, 45. What those numbers mean is the first one's the width, 
six, 6.5 millimeters wide or 7.5, 8.5. And the next number is the length, okay? So then you load the screw and you hand it to me and the surgeon is supposed to check it to make sure it's the correct width and length. Because if you get too long, what can happen is, you can go beyond the bone and you say, what's this right here? It's an iliac artery. Yeah, so that's gonna be pretty embarrassing for the surgeon, right? So that's why length is so important. You can't overshoot and go into an artery. And then you have to flip the patient over, call general surgery, do an X-lap. Really embarrassing. Never happened to me. Knock us on the So check the screw length, verify with the surgeon. They'll never get mad at you for verifying the, uh, the screw. We always say trust and verify. We're not questioning, we're just verifying. All right, so I put the screw in. So I tapped it, I probed it, I usually probe twice, I put the screw in, and once all the screws are in, now I put the rod in, okay? So then you ask me, what length rod do you want? No, and the, the numbers is millimeters. We use metric system in the OR, all right? So you know, I'll say 110 millimeters. So you get that rod, I put in these little caps, these little, the central, oh, I'm sorry, these tulips, they call them tulips. And then I just fasten it to the screws, so we use the set caps, all right? So now it's really important. The facet caps are small. You gotta keep track of these things. If you lose one in the patient, it's not good. You gotta go back and get it. Open the patient back up. So a lot of facet caps have these little final tighteners on top that break off into an uh, instrument. After we put all the caps in, you have to count the facets that are on top of it. You should have eight, all right? There's eight screws here. You should have eight on the field. If you have anything less, you cannot close. This is where we get into counts. So we count the caps. So if the count is off, we have to look for it. And then uh, and the last resort is we take an x-ray, okay? And we make sure it's not in the, um, usually it falls on the ground or under, it's in my glove or something. Um, so count, counts are important. So before we close now, so we got the rods in there, we put, we put our biologic in, now we count everything, sutures, needles, all that stuff, right? So now when the count's correct, and we start closing, okay? And that's the way you ask what sutures we like to use for closure, all right? All right, next one. Okay, good. Cervical. All right, so I got a double whammy here. So cervical, you can treat from the front and back, right? So the front's called ACDF, anterior cervical discectomy fusion. And the back is the posterior laminectomy fusion. So I got a case where you did both, so you can learn both things at one time. So an ACDF is a patient supiner prone. Let me back up, what does supine mean? Yeah, what's prone mean? Right. So an ACDF, anterior, so the patient's supine, all right? So things you gotta ask me now, what instruments are you gonna use? What retractors are you gonna use? So this patient had a car accident and her spinal cord is pushed forward there, all right? So this is an MRI. So this patient is paralyzed, okay? So. We do a couple things here. When you go from the front, all right, and remove this fracture and put some, do an ACDF. So the patient's supine first. So we use something called Cloward retractors. These are very important to know to have. So they retract the trachea and esophagus, so I don't get into them, okay? So it's important to have Cloward's a variety of them. And then we use a lot of things called peanuts. You know what peanuts are? Mm -hmm. All right, so neurosurgery uses a million peanuts. All right, I don't know what it is, what else? peanuts. So I can't have enough peanuts on the field. So we use peanuts to dissect the tissue. It's a, it's a nice blunt way of doing it without cutting into anything. It's a safe way. That way you don't open the esophagus up. But it's also very bad. All right, we're trying to avoid bad things in life. You know? So peanuts, flowers, and then to mark the level, if it's not trauma, we always see a fracture. I usually use a um, bayoneted spinal needle. All right? And I'll teach you how to do it. You bend it twice, it's a bayonet, and I put it in the disc space, and I take an x-ray. So now we're talking about x-rays. So then you ask, Dr. Patel, are you wearing lead? Should I wear lead? So there's two ways of doing it. One, we all wear lead, we do it at the field. It gets really hot and wet. Or two, we have um, lead shields. I'm a lead shields guy. So I don't like anyone, need, anyone near being, anyone, need, anyone near the uh, x-ray field when we're taking shots. We all walk behind a shield. All right, it's head to toe. We don't want cataracts, we don't want thyroid cancer. You know, it's good for all of us, all right? So I'll tell you, hey, it's 100 degrees in here, you don't need to wear lead. I will walk behind the shield. Okay, and then the next question is, how do you want to drape the x-ray? Do you want something called C-armor, where it's something you tape and pull on and on? Or do you just want, 
<laughs> my first time using PowerPoint. Now. All right. So you want sea armor, or do you want uh, you know just you keep changing drapes out? We usually just use sea armor cheaper, and not keep changing things out because every time you go to axial, I'm sorry, uh, AP versus lateral, you're using a drape. So we don't want to you know, control cost. So I usually say sea armor for mine. Okay. So now we we, uh, we make we make. So now we're going to talk about surgery. The patient's supine. All right, the next exposed is marked. So what's the first thing I need? How do I get in the skin? Scalpel. Scalpel, all right? Now, I'm gonna undermine the platysma, all right? So I use sharp dissection, I use scissors. That's usually what I use, okay? So the Met's ready. And before I get through the platysma, I use um, gels with teeth, okay? So now I open the platysma. What's below the platysma? This carotid is the, um, is the IVC, is all kinds of bad things. So now I can't use tooth forceps, right? So I can poke holes in things. I don't want to poke holes in. So if the juggler's in my way, the IJ, you know, or the external juggler, all these massive veins are hard to repair. You, you, we, we switch out to the bakeys. The bakeys are good pickups without teeth in them. And that's important. So the surgeon will assume you just know this. So, so once they open the platysma, they'll put their hand out and you switch out their pickups from jails with teeth with the bakeys. Because now they can't poke holes in things. All right? Now we have debakies in my hand, it says I'm dissecting down, going down from here to here. That's why I use my peanuts to dissect the tissue, okay? And once I have the tissue dissected, now I put some retractor system in there. There's a million of them, the shadow line, the VersaTrack, whatever our preference is, and these are little blades you put in there. So you ask them, what size blades do you need? We, we do, what I usually do is I take a suction, I put it in there, and I pick it up, and I go this long. You know, and then, and then the scrub tech goes like that, you know. Like, <laughs> and then they give me the blades and we put them in. And there's a retractor now, it clicks in, so it keeps it open so I can view this whole area now, all right? And then to do a discectomy, we use a combination of curettes, pituitaries, um, and then when we get down to the PLL right here, then we might need a nerve hook or a few other things. And these are the questions to ask. What will you need throughout the surgery? And they'll tell you all the instruments. They put those in the mail. Nothing annoys us more than things in the mail that don't need to be there like a horsey bone cutter, and like spine, uh, ACDF. We'll never use that, you know? So ask them, all right, these are my instruments in the mail. Is there anything you don't want on here that's cluttering stuff? Can I get rid of anything? And they'll say, all right, we don't need this, this, and this. Bring this up here. The instruments used repeatedly should be on your mail, not on your back table. Nothing annoys us more than to keep going to the back table and get an instrument we keep using every three seconds. And the instruments we never use on the mail. All right, so the mail is your best friend. The instruments you use them all the time go on the mail. Things you barely use on the back table, okay? Mm -hmm. And we'll actually tell you, so like, during surgery, like, all right, now we're moving to the instrumentation part, the laminectomy part. I don't need all this instrumentation stuff anymore. Get rid of it. Clean up the mail, all right? So we do the ACDF. Here's the x-ray, all right? So here's a huge plate. I did a corpectin, I put a cage in there, all right? So now I flip the patient over and I do a prone now. So now the same applies as the lumbar. All right, so I put a bunch of screws in the back. Right. Yeah, this patient had that titanium deficiency, which I fixed. All right. <laughs> so all these screws reinforce this fracture now, okay? Um, so it's the same process as before. Drill, gear shift, ball probe, screw, okay? And caps the war. You're counting a lot of caps right now. All right? And that's that patient, okay? All right, so any questions on spine? This is the most you're gonna see in the community. Cranial stuff is usually like big center stuff. So the majority of people go into community centers, okay? Because it pays more, better lifestyle. There's a lot of pros to it. Um, so the most, most stuff you'll see is spine. So these are the good questions to ask. Any questions? I explained it that well? <laughs> All right. All right, so this is our group. This is 2019. Scrub tech, scrub tech, that's me. <laughs> Circulating nurse. We bring the whole OR with us. Wow. Wow. 15 bags, 75 pounds each, that's a drill. Uh, this bag has the bogey, bipolar. Literally, we have a room with a plug, and the plug sometimes works, all right? So this is how you, this is how you uh, really learn how to do a scrub tech. And we do pick take students with us. So Ann is a senior scrub tech, Pearl's a senior scrub tech. They teach as well. So we do bring like one or two students with us every time. It's a good way to kind of do a crash course and everything. And 
the, the, we, we cannot bring, um, we never bring fresh grads. It's not because I'm biased or anything. The reason being is when you're a scrub tech, a neurosurgeon, a nurse, in your life you escape experiences, right? And if experience was a bank account, you put deposits in it every day. As you go through life, you go through adversity, you have trouble in the OR, you put deposit experience. And when you go to Africa and something doesn't work, you take huge withdrawals out of the bank account. All right, you use your experience to kind of figure things out. You guys are all too young to know who MacGyver is. No? No. <laughs> Sad, millennials. Um, so we MacGyver a lot of stuff meaning we, we figure it out, the power goes up, we have to figure out what to do. So this is where your experience matters. That's why we don't take fresh grads, because they have no experience to draw on. So Anne's been doing this for 40 years, Pearl's been doing it for 30 years. That's uh, 70 years of experience. So I don't need to worry about anything. You know, I just show up, they make me look good. Um, I do give them a lot of credit though. So in Kenya, there's always like a news crew waiting for me. And I, I, like, I hate attention like that. So I'll push Pearl up front. Like this. And that's why interviewing her, and she hates attention too. And it's just really funny. She's she trying to back up, like, I don't know. So, uh, you know, they'll fix the drill, stops working, anything breaks, they'll, fix, they'll figure it out, Kerrison breaks, because there's no replacements. What we brought is all we have, and if we forgot something, we need to figure out a workaround. So let's pretend we forgot, like, on rainy clips, that we do the interrupted sutures. So, Pearl and Ellie, I. We forgot rain clips, so they'll have load a bunch of silk sutures for me to do the interrupted things. So we're already ready to go, because they anticipate things. And they anticipate disasters, okay? So that's why experience matters. So we do take students, you guys are welcome to come. Um, but you, you get to scrub in, you have fun. Um, but what we'll we want them teaching you guys. I'll let you like, drown out there, all right? All right, and the last thing is, it's kind of advice, advice for life. Write your own script. You know, this is the beginning of your stage. Like, this is a fun place to be, as you guys. Like, I love being a student. Um, you can make mistakes, because people that don't oversee you and fix them. This is the time to learn, ask lots of questions. And then, you know, your first job is not your last job. And your goal is to keep going up, right? So my whole life, I've been, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I've been just applying to everything. Anytime a leadership position came, I just applied to it. Even if I was underqualified, not qualified, to learn the experience. You know, so I started applying to being president of the hospital, CEO, just for fun. You know, something that just annoy people. But <laughs> it gets your name out there and also teaches you how to interview, how to build a resume, do a mission statement, and you know, always try to go for the next level. So you guys start off as students, your next goal should be a pod leader, like they were. You know, you'll be the neurosurgery pod leader, the cardiothoracic pod leader, right? You're gaining value. And then other hospitals try to poach you then. Because they don't want to train anybody. Hey, you know, like, what's your name? Tori. Like, hey, Tori, you ran a CV service for five years. We'll give you another 50K to come over here. You know? And that happens a lot. Yeah. You know? And there is no loyalty in healthcare. All right? It's important lessons for you guys. You can be loyal to a system for 20 years, and if they do layoffs, you'll be the first one gone, and you're like, why did I do all that? So always, I don't want to say look out for yourself, but just look out for your greater good. So you have a better opportunity to learn, improve yourself, or um, let's pretend you're doing a lap happy, and a scrub tech comes in and says, hey, Tori, they're doing a brain tumor over there. You want to go over there, and I'll be able to do this. Take the opportunity to go. Because the more you learn, the better your resume gets. So like when you guys, I know traveling, scrub tech is really huge right now. The only people that can travel are people with experience, though. You're not taking new grads. And your resume, you check off things. I can do cranial, I can do CV. The more you can check off, honestly, don't lie, uh, the better your resume is gonna be. Every now and then I'll have someone that says, I did brain, I did neurosurgery, and they come to the OR, they don't know what Penfield is, and they're gone the next day. It's just the way life works. You can't lie in a resume, because the surgeon will figure you out fast. You know, we're, especially if you're a traveler, we assume you're experienced. Because the only experience people become travelers. And if you don't know what an instrument is, like a basic instrument, I'm not gonna ask you like, some exotic thing that no one's heard of. But if you don't know what Pedro or Woodson is, like we know pretty quickly you've never been in the OR. Because those are universal instruments. So get in every OR, every specialty, even if you don't like it. Let's pretend you hate ortho. Just absolutely despise it. Learn it. So when you go on an interview, you can say, I can do ortho, I can do gen surge, I can do scopes, I can do EMT, I can do eyes, I can do neurosurgery, I can do anything you throw at me. And your value tremendously increases, and they will pay to keep you. Because no one wants to train people anymore. They just want to plug and play people. And this is the best time to do as a student. 
the more experience you get now, the better your resume is. And then, you know, ask your preceptors, like, where can I go to get X experience? I don't have enough ortho, or more ortho, or like whatever. And don't say, I just, I prefer this right now. You prefer nothing. You know nothing, you prefer nothing. <laughs> All right? So uh, go on every OR, run everything, ask lots of questions, and keep a notebook. You know, for like, um, Anne, for example, she has a notebook of every surgery I do. So trainee, she has the things I like. So I, I ask her nothing. Her and I discuss everything in the world except the surgery. Because I'm just putting my hand out, the instrument I need to come to my hand, I never have to check it, the, and then she hands it correctly. I have to flip the left cell, I have to flip the kerosene, I don't have to reload my needle. It's seamless, okay? And that, the reason she can do that is because she writes down my preferences. Every surgeon's weird. We're the weirdest people in the world, we have weird quirks, and she writes down everyone's quirks, all her surgeons. She's a little notebook, she flips through it. I see her in the corner of my eye. I'm like, oh, I'm doing this, and she'll flip through it, she's like, okay, and then she'll tell the team. All right, he's gonna need the following things. He likes the following things this way, and now it's seamless, it's better for the patient. So keep a little notebook. It doesn't have to be huge. Yeah, you know, something small, and write down preferences. Like, all right, they always need this, always need that. And as you get better, the surgeon will start vouching for you. Like, hey, I'm on toy my more every time. That's huge. And the surgeon, the hospital sees value in you, and they'll pay to keep you. Because I'll say, I'm not doing any more surgery unless she comes back. You better pay her what she's asking. Or, hey, we need to take this, I worked with this girl at another hospital, I want to bring her here. You know, and as you get your value up, that's how you increase things. And become quad leaders, get your RFA, which is registered first assist, then you can close, open, increases your versatility. All right? Yep. Oh, no, I was going to. Oh, don't go to auction. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, wait. That's it. <laughs> 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 right. Dr. Patel, what yeah. is your mission statement? My mission statement? Yes. In general? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so the reason that uh, my practice has a huge international following, so I have patients flying in from all over the world, is because we don't care about money and volume, we only care about outcomes. Mm -hmm. So we're not a volume or money based practice. So the majority of America is um, consumer based, right? The more yeah. surgeries you do, the more money you make. Yeah. Our paradigm is the opposite, where it's outcomes based. So my practice has the lowest infection rate in Massachusetts three years in a row because we don't operate where we walk from the door. And we also have very strict criteria. So you have to have a certain BMI. We check if you're smoking. Um, we ask you a thousand questions. And we improve those things before we operate. Sometimes making someone lose weight is more important than the surgery itself. So if a patient is really overweight, we'll say, hey, they'll be able to probably get a fifth opinion. Say, hey, these four surgeons say I need a big fusion. I'll say, you need a bariatric surgeon. You don't need me right now. And then they come back, the back pain's gone, because we lost all the weight, um, so they don't need surgery anymore. The diabetes is gone, the blood pressure's gone. You know, so we made them better in that way. So even like now, your goal should not be making money, because then you should go on finance or banking. You know, your, your goal should be taking care of good care of your patients. Um, don't be petty. Um, don't undermine your colleagues. These are all your friends here, all right? And in a hospital setting, it's a little bit like a high school, and they'll tell you, a lot of clicks. And don't get in that whole vibe. You know, kind of mind your own business, don't get in the gossip. If you're like a person that plays along with everybody, you will move up fast. You know, because people will say, hey, she likes to talk, or he likes to talk. You know, they undermine their surgeon, they undermine their staff. And they, they get filtered out pretty quickly. So just kind of aim to just be better, and then things will fall in place. And then, are there any questions here? <laughs> How long have you been doing this? What was that? Oh, I've been a nurse since 2011. What made you choose now? Because I'm a dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> My dream job is a Trader Joe's <laughs> You think you know what Trader Joe's is? Yes. So they are the happiest people oh you've been in your life. So what's the goal of life? The overall goal of life is to be content with thoughts of happiness. So happiness is an emotional state, it's only like 13 seconds, unless you're a toddler. Then you have happiness for like 45 minutes. <laughs> right, with like bubbles, or a puppy. The dumbest things keep them happy for 45 minutes. But human beings, as you're an adult, happiness is like a 10 to 15 second thing. Content means you're satisfied. And Trader Joe's employees are so happy. So like, this is the end goal of life, so I, I just be a Trader Joe's uh, greeter. Yeah. You know, but I got into neurosurgery because um, I was a neuroscience major in college, and um, I, I knew that the greatest impact I could make was through brain surgery because you take a tumor on the patient lives forever, right? 
take a tumor of a baby, the baby lives forever. That's a patient that can now contribute to the economy, grow, um, opposed to like, um, you know, any other specialty where you're not, you're improving things, you're not really saving a life. So in these countries we operate in, there's no welfare, there's no social security, there's no food stamps. If they cannot work, they die. They literally starve to death. So when we fix them, they literally go back to work and they feed their family again. So you're actually impacting a whole family unit, especially if it's a breadwinner. You know, maybe it's the mother that does all the seamstress, whatever, whoever making the money, and they're out because of a brain tumor or something, we fix them, they go back and they start working, and they want to get better. So interestingly, our outcomes are insanely better in Africa and Kenya and India than they are in America. Because there's no workman's comp, there's no disability, there's no reason to want to be hurt. So they have to get back, and they all do really well. Yeah, any other questions? My favorite color is blue. Have you ever considered teaching, like full time? Yeah, uh, so I'm a professor at Harvard. Oh, you are. Yeah, oh. so yeah, so I mean, we uh, <laughs> we teach a, yeah, <laughs> uh, we teach a lot. Um, so we have in our hospital we have scrub tech students, nursing students, medical students, residents, interns, or big academic academic centers, right? Um, so you know, it's kind of comes part of the job. You're always teaching somewhere, you're always doing lectures somewhere. So usually in the fall, I do. Um, it's my seventh lecture, actually. It's my only, it's my first non-med school university lecture. You know, thanks for coming here. So I'm going to USF tomorrow, get a lecture there. So that, we kind of coordinated that, so I came a day early. So, um, yeah. So yeah, we do a lot, you know, teaching and stuff, it's fun. And when, once I have a child, I'll just teach full time. And when my hands start shaking or something. <laughs> Hopefully not soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Did you want to go into the lab and just look yeah. at some of the instruments and you guys had questions about it? Of course, we set up a laminectomy set up and a cranium set up. All right, so we'll do, we'll do this. We'll do one each and then we'll go live, all right? What does that so, mean for live? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll pretend we're doing real surgery. Oh, we're we'll live. Right, so we do a, so in, in the Boston, we have a sim lab, kind of yours, and we have a scrub tech, scrub tech student, nursing, nursing student. We do a full lab. We, we simulate situations like fire, I write some of these situations, <coughs> mine are hilarious. So like, uh, I had this one situation I wrote where I had a smoke machine, I got from uh, Party City. <laughs> so I simulated a fire. Um, so I had the music blasting, like really loud. You know, so you couldn't hear anything. And the anesthesia, the us, and then I, uh, we turned the fog machine on to simulate a or fire. And then like, I don't know if you guys, you guys know what Seinfeld is? Yes. So there's an episode where George Costanza runs out of the building. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. So, I, so I pulled a George Costanza. So we, the fire, we, we set the fog machine off. And I was like, oh my god! I ran out of the OR. <laughs> so then, when we, then I went to the, the um, control room. And I watched. What does my team do when the surgeon freaks out and runs away? All right, now you have no doctor. It's just you guys. So we saw how they figured out how to stop the fire, call for help, all that stuff. You know, because we can pass out too. We're just we're humans and scared walls. You need to figure out what to do when the surgeon passes out or something crazy, right? So we, we do situations like that, we do codes, all that stuff. They're pretty fun. When my man can die, I'm very dramatic. Jimmy, <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't go towards the light. <laughs> <laughs> you have family. <laughs>